Welcome to Madame Ravens. This way to the library. She's been expecting you. Welcome back to Greenland, my darlings. Here is part two and the finale of Boneless by Bear Lair 64. Frodo set out with a small group and headed along the coast to visit the western outposts. He'd never made the journey on foot. He never had to. They'd always made it by watercraft. They met with no serious mishaps or challenges, but the journey overland was long. They pressed inland to cut down on the miles. They drew near to the eternal ice cap that covered the bulk of the landmass. They traveled closer until they could spy the gleaming white sheets off to the north. Wondrous and bleak all at once, Frodo pronounced to positive mutters when they halted for a brief rest. The ice cap had kept them from settling further inland. They'd heard that some of the Skraelings lived on it. Nomads who chased game and lived a very primitive lifestyle. But it was not a place for civilized people. Ten days from when they set out, they reached the largest settlement. It was utterly empty. The buildings were closed and no smoke rose to greet the late afternoon sun. Even the church was abandoned. The candles and candle holders all gone. They found nothing edible even when they scoured all the buildings. There was nothing of use, and no ships or boats berthed in the docks. It was truly a ghost town. They settled in for the night and decided to use the church as a camping spot to rest for a day and then return. In the darkness before dawn, Frodo awoken to the whispers and the scuffling of feet outside the front doors. He'd set a watch just in case and had taken the last shift. He listened carefully. He could almost make out the words in the harsh whispers. No. Make scream. He could not hear all the whispered words, yet he understood the language. Hello? We are friends from the East, he called through the door. Shortly, the two groups greeted one another. The last three members of the colony were thralls, two of their own people and a Skrelik woman. No, master. They all left didn't take us, no room on the ships, and not enough food. We tried to make a place with the Skraelings, but they wouldn't take us, not even her. He jerked a thumb towards the ugly little brow-beaten woman, who never raised her head or eyes. Best we could tell, she wasn't from their tribe, or they didn't like that she'd been with the White Skins. Maybe you'd let us go with you? There's nobody left here of our folk. We was thinking of heading your ways anyhow. Thorsten missed his new wife. He was loath to be separated from her. Sigrid Bjorn's daughter was far better than any woman remaining in this godforsaken land, Gronland. He and his little band had crossed overland and already passed over the closed ground above the crevasse and its cavern full of terrifying creatures. His nerves had remained taut the entire time as they walked over the place where his imaginings lived in the mass and monstrosities far below ground. The land ascended and they were forced inland a little. Now that the night was coming, he had four companions, a middle-aged man, Arn the eagle-eyed, and his adolescent son, a young widow, and the widow's stepson. A lad of twelve, large for his age. The young man, Arnson, called out to the group, Come see, I found a grotto, a place out of the wind. Thornston responded, Coming, Arnson, nothing over this way but rocks and ice. The young stalwart had indeed found a grotto, an opening in the rock face that led northward towards the ice cap. Ah, wonderful. Shelter. And if it's deep enough, perhaps water. 
He smiled to encourage the other members of the party. After they'd rested for the night, they breakfasted on trail rations and warmed themselves at their small turf fire. We've been at this for most of a week with no sign of life. I think that if we find no one else living, we should turn back to Havalsi at midday. Thornston offered to general approbation. They set out once more, paralleling the ice sheet that glistened in the near distance. This part of Gronlin was more desolate than any other they'd seen, barren of both human and beast. As the sun approached Zenith, they halted in a gaggle. Are we ready for home? Thornston inquired. The smiles and nods were enthusiastic, as the tired countenances could manage. They turned south to explore back along the coast, as closely as they dared. Shortly, Arn eagle-eyed spied moving figures in their new path. Thornston, I see a group of people crossing a small rise to the south. They're coming inland from the coast, maybe a dozen or more. Can't tell what they are at this distance, but they are beyond the steading of any of our known eastern colonies. Likely they are Skraelings. Thornston grunted acknowledgement. No one could see better than Arn, unless it was his son, Arn Arnson, who confirmed his father's suspicions. I agree, father. They move in a direct line, and the smaller ones remain in the middle, perhaps a family or two of them migrating or a war band on the prowl. They awaited the approaching family group, and each party greeted the other to ensure that the other knew that they had no ill intentions. The Skraelegs were clearly a family group on the move since they each carried large burdens, except for the few men at the front and the back of the column, who carried spears. Thorsten and Arnett each spoke some of the dialects of the strangers that they'd learned from trading and from captured slaves. The Skraelegs knew some of the Norse that was the most common tongue among the original settlers, for the same reasons. You come from the sea, but we thought that your people inhabited the ice shelf. Thorsten greeted them without preliminaries, while neither party wanted to engage in hostilities. Neither had any interest in passing time with pleasantries. The lead male, clearly the eldest among those whose faces were clearly visible, responded, Yes, our people now settle where yours have fled. We are returning to the lands we know. The Great Water is a haunted, unfriendly place. Thorsten nodded in agreement, as much as understanding. We too have suffered in the Great Water. Now most of us have left for our old lands as you do now. There is a safe grotto for camping about half a day's march on our back trail. The stoic-looking Inuit grunted acknowledgement and thanks. We left the frozen shelf some months ago because it trembled and shook, and in some places broke. Our clan was much larger in those days, but many died in the trembling ice. His eyes went distant for a moment, filled with tragic memories and traumatic times. We thought that the land near the big water would be safer, but it was not, and many more died. We are all that is left of our clan. We will not return all the way to the ice shelf until we are far from the great water. Something evil and very large now lives under the waves and under the ice nearest them. Thorsten nodded. We call it the Kraken, an old enemy. We have looked for any of our people to let them know that we are leaving Kronland. Our descendants may one day return, but we are finished and too many have perished with no purpose. You are right, the land has turned sour and evil. Our ancestors would not know it for the place they chose to settle. I wish your family safe travels and thank you for the knowledge of the trembling ice. Some of our people wish to try living there, but this knowledge will help dissuade them. Each party then returned to its own journey and the Skraelings were soon lost to distance even for the Arns. The elder of them spoke as the party trudged back towards home. They are very unprepossessing folk, 
Yet I would not wish such travels on any person. I, for one, will be happy to escape this cursed land. We will remain in Iceland only long enough to work and make a little money, then we are bound for Norway. We once had considered settling in the islands north of Scotland. But I, for one, will never again settle near the sea or on an island in the midst of it. We may even move south into the Germanys. That afternoon, the sky turned dark above the distant North Atlantic. A strong squall approached, and the wind freshened from the direction of the coast. The party deliberately turned inland, and soon were driven naturally northward by the wind and the whipping sheets of rain. They sought shelter along the wall of the land where it rose to support the eternal ice above. Thorsten sought and found a crevasse, similar to the one that had saved him after his experience with the Kraken. Though the ground around it was soft and less bleak than the one on the coast had been. Come, we will shelter here. We will have no fire, but we will escape this hellish wind. The opening in the ground was wider than the one near Havalsi. The roof was open for only a short way, which worked well, since the downpour from the storm easily penetrated from the top of their temporary home. There was no fire or light available, yet they'd soon groped their way into a space that was beyond the torrent of water that deluged the front part of the split and tortured earth. Some light still managed to seep through the wide gap above, and once their eyes adjusted, they could see well enough. Each huddled against the next for warmth as the day waned towards evening. Thorsten awakened from a dream of skittering, chittering insect sounds. He heard scuffling in the deep, dark recesses of the cave, and his mind immediately took him to the horror of the insect pit. Yet he quickly realized that these sounds in the waking world possessed a different quality. Someone or something was moving in the cave behind the group. He counted the lumps of sleeping bodies beside him. The boy, Snorri, was no longer at his stepmother's side. Thorsten arose and called quietly so as to not disturb the others. Snorri, where have you gone? From the inky blackness, Snorri's cracked voice responded, I am here, Thorsten. I could not sleep. I kept hearing noises from the back of the cave, so I went to check. As he spoke, the boy's voice grew in volume and the sounds of his approaching footsteps apprised Thorsten that he had walked back from a considerable distance. Stay with the group. If you must wander, go out to the front. I know it's cold and wet there, but caverns. In the rock face are dangerous places. It is easy to get lost inside them and there are other dangers. He trailed off since he did not want to frighten the boy. Thorsten kept his voice calm. He understood the restlessness and energy of youth. Get some rest and we will be home before you know it. Then will all of us make a great voyage. We used to go trading, but walrus ivory is no longer in demand. Traders no longer come our way at all. There's nothing to trade and no prospects in our land but Mira's survival. The voyage will be a great adventure like the Vikings, the wayfarers of old. I plan to take my bride to Iceland and see what opportunities lie at the former edge of the world. Snorri nodded, though Thorsten could not clearly see it. Yes, I am excited. I'm a little scared of the Kraken, but nothing else. Father Newt says there's nothing to fear from the Kraken. It is a demon of the deep, but that with proper and fervent prayer we will be able to pass it and make our way back to safer, more Christian lands. The boy paused. I'm not sure that I believe the priest. Maybe the old gods are dead, or like the priest claim, never existed. Yet I believe they lived, and the monsters they fought still live. So maybe they are still with us, just standing back in the shadows, while the priests and their god rail and rant and speak mostly of Satan. Thorsten smiled. He'd had similar thoughts, especially of late. The two talked for a short time, and presently, as the gaps in their conversation increased, 
he heard the quiet snores of the boys, whose vast energy had deserted him in the sudden need for sleep, so common in youth. When light again penetrated their provincial lair, it was not from the opening above, but from the opening of the tunnel behind them. Due to the contrast with the pitch darkness, the dim, pulsating glow was more noticeable and effective than it might have been otherwise. It approached, and numerous claws clattered across the surface of the rocky floor. Arnson was the first to detect the approaching throng. He arose and looked backwards towards the coming light. Many small lights that worked together, like an army of fireflies, he thought sleepily. As they advanced, he saw that the lights were low to the ground and bobbed as if on thin stalks, which indeed they were. He soon realized that the lights belonged to and were generated by living mass of tremendous insects, like large, oblong platters with many legs and protruding stalks, each sporting a small glowing orb. Get up! They're coming! He shouted to rouse his party. He'd already risen and was backing towards the small waterfall that had developed from the rainwater flowing into the front of the crevasse from the higher elevations above the opening. His father was next to awaken, then Thornston. The woman, Badil, sat up sharply, feeling at the space next to her, and then she leapt to her feet and called to her stepson, Snorri, where are you, son? With the exception of Badil, the entire party was soon alerted, standing and backing towards the thin waterfall. She stood facing the array of lights, still calling to her stepson, Snorri, are you there? Answer me! Thorsten stepped forward to take hold of her arm and pull her back from the approaching swarm, but she shook off his grip and strode towards the now slowing insects. Snorri, where are you? she shouted plaintively. From deep within the cavern came an answering cry, faint with distance, a mere echo from the depths. Help me, Rodil! They're all around me! The spiders are coming! The cries arose to shrieks of fear and agony, and then faded. The army of light came to a halt several feet back from the humans who had invaded the forecourt of their subterranean castle. Badil sobbed in hopelessness, and Thorsten patted her shoulder and assured her, We'll get him back. He's wandered into the tunnels. He's afraid of the strange creatures, but we will find him. He noted that his voice quavered. He was terrified and held out no real hopes for the boy's well-being. He took the hand axe and Zexa from his belt and approached the skittering swarm that had halted just shy of the sleeping rolls of the humans had so recently abandoned. Antennae extended to explore the still warm blankets and accoutrements. Thorsten shielded his CX, strode forward and snatched up his stout walking staff that included a sharp iron tip. He brought it at the closest of the curious Euripides, and they retreated from the steel tip of the walking stick. They fouled their fellows, and the entire mass quivered as individual members adjusted to the movements of those in front and shifted to once again finding solid footing. Thorsten noted that a stream of the creatures had begun to approach around the verges of the main body along the walls. They were unable to cling to the vertical surfaces, as would smaller insects. Yet they found enough purchase that they were able to approach along a different path than those halted by the strange sensations caused by human presence. Thorstens battled at these intrepid explorers and soon found that Arn and Arnson were at either side, and that each employed the harpoons they had carried with them for protection. Badil soon joined the group and flailed about with her walking staff. The insectoids, in confusion at the physical resistance and taking some damage, turned and fled back to the depths with which they'd come. They left behind the still bodies of their dead and the twitching forms of many injured individuals. Come, Thorsten shouted and followed them. He wanted to save the boy if there was any hope, at least from being devoured by these hideous denizens of the underworld. We can use our lights to follow them. 
For all that the horde had approached slowly, they apparently possessed the ability to move quickly when necessary, and they now fled the footfalls of the humans in earnest. They were soon far ahead of their more cautious pursuers. The tunnel sloped steeply downward and then leveled off into a slow descent. The bobbing light soon faded into a pulsing glow and darkness encroached. But only briefly did the party stumble along, clutching at the walls and shuffling forward carefully to avoid any pitfalls. Soon, a steady glow emanated from the walls and ceiling. Smaller insects clung there, each with its own orange, fire-like orb and fungi grew that produced a bluish glow. The party was soon making good time. Until they came to a fork in the tunnel, one branch plunged downward and the other remained mostly level. There was no indication which way the chitin-armored swarm had gone. Thorsten suggested that they remain on a level pathway. He recalled the cavern with the varied hordes of monstrosities at its deep base. Arne offered that he and his son could take the low road, but Thorsten soon had him convinced that they had best remain together. Bodil had until then remained silent and intent on finding Snorri. She now called out for him and heard her own voice echo as had his. There was no response. Only a repeated and soon lost repetition of Snorri! They proceeded along the more level pathways until shortly, from up ahead, a more intense glow began to emerge from a space ahead. I think it may be a cavern, maybe like the ones I found closer to home. Thorsten admonished his companions. Keep your weapons handy. He followed his own advice and once again took axe and walking staff in hand and loosened his short sword, long knife in its scabbard. The opening with its well of light was indeed a cavern. The floor was dry and sloped down towards one side, yet there was no dramatic drop as with the first inner earth space Thorsten had encountered. The light suffused the entire area as the glowing fungi expanded and covered the walls, but did not grow near the ceiling. The ceiling appeared to have a smoky quality, white, like from burning damp wood. Thorsten soon realized it was the bottom side of the great ice shelf that covered so much of Quanlan. Bodil shrieked, Snorri! and then choked off sobs as she covered her eyes with her hand. Thorsten saw where the floor sloped to its lowest section. There was a hole in the floor of the cavern. Above the hole dangled the lifeless corpse of the boy Snorri, hanging from a thick white strand his head hung downward over the hole, his eyes open, dry and bulging, and his acne-plagued face flushed dark with blood that had drained from the rest of his body. Thorsten took a few steps towards the boy, but halted and immediately retreated. Bodil's horrified wail had brought the authors of the boy's demise. Huge spiders boiled from the hole in the floor and swarmed towards the four remaining live humans. There was no time to flee, only to fight the swarm of venomous arachnids as they poured into the cavern. The humans employed the weapons they had and did their best to kick and stomp at the creatures with their heavy bodies, the long, thin, spiky legs. They were pressed backwards into the tunnel and fought a desperate rearguard action. Once in the tunnel, the spiders began to climb the walls and drop from above. One entangled in Brodil's hair, which had become loosened during the activities of the night and day. She screamed and flailed at it, but Arn's son was quick and accurate with his harpoon. He speared the fat body and flung it aside without grazing Brodil's head. They soon noticed that the press of arachnine warriors slowed. The further they drew away from the cavern and down the tunnel, eventually they were able to disengage and flee back the way they had come. They ran until they reached the fork, then stopped, gasping and inhaling heavy breaths. Arn the eagle-eyed spoke first. He sounded strained and sagged against the wall. Thorsten, did you see the roof of the cave? It was ice. We've been under the ice sheet for some time. The cavern was actually a pit in the earth with a roof of ice. It should have been filled with ice. 
but the air from that hole was warm. He slumped onto the floor, gasping with effort and pain. Father, Arnson called and kneeled beside the older man. What's wrong? Arn smiled grimly at his youngest son. I believe I'm dying, son. I received more than one bite from those things. Their venom is strong. He coughed and choked for a moment. You must all free Kwanlan. He gagged for a moment. The land is cursed and the ice covers dark secrets. His body seized in a paroxysm. Then his head lulled to one side and his breath rattled from his throat. Arnson clutched at him and whispered words of grief into the bluish glow that surrounded them. Thornston wished to give the boy a moment to grieve, but the sounds from the opening of the tunnel aroused his attention. Something large and armored approached from the darkness where the party had slept. There may have been more than one creature, but it was not the same sound of the initial swarm. It seemed to come from something or things that were bigger. Perhaps there were other apparatures that they had missed in the dim light cast by the insects and fungi. Come, we must take the plunging way. Bodil looked at him, and then at Arnson, and finally at the corpse of Arn the eagle-eyed. She trembled and appeared to be on the verge of panic, but Arnson seized her wrist. Let's go, Bodil. I know you've been shocked and hurt, as have I, but we must survive to warn our people. With that, he tugged her along and they fled down the steep tunnel that they had avoided earlier. The growth on the walls was not as abundant, especially on the lower reaches, and the little lightning bugs were absent altogether. So the way was dim, though not unlit. They moved as rapidly as good sense allowed. But they still must be aware of the splits in the tunnel and cracks and debris on the floor. Presently, the sounds of pursuit came to them. There was no rush of hard, sharp appendages, simply the steady trod of many feet, clattering and clicking and grating on both stone and eardrums. We must increase our pace, Thornston encouraged his remaining comrades. The tunnel widened and they entered a cave that offered a dozen or more egresses, all of them plunging downward and with varying degrees of luminosity at the far terminus of most. They looked around in consternation and indecision. Finally, Thornston approached the opening that was nearest to being directly across from the passage they had exited. This way, their leader called, and once more they plunged deeper into the solid earth. The tunnel proved to be small, and the ceiling lowered in places so that they had to stoop to avoid striking their heads on the inflexible surface. The heavy skittering of whatever followed them echoed down the passageway. The light ahead of them intensified, and Thorsten feared that they were about to enter the lair of the spiders, since the upcoming chamber had to have been nearly below the pit in the ice roof cavern though it was hard to tell with the turns and twists of the tunnels and with no open sky to guide them. He heard a new sound from the open space, the sloshing and splashing of water. They emerged into a vast space and found themselves on the shore of an inland lake or sea. There was a brackish order to the stale air that hinted at the latter. There was an accompanying foul stench that clouded the space like the one finds at ebb tide. Trapped. The word likely sounded in the minds of his companions as well, though neither spoke a word. There was room to move laterally along the walls in either direction while remaining on the beach of black gravel. Thorsten cast looks towards both available pathways, then turned away from where he thought the spider cave resided. The others followed without protest, and they jogged along the shoreline, each of them nearing exhaustion. He chanced to look back at the tunnel from which they'd recently fled, and his breath caught. He observed several long, thick, sinuous figures, each with numerous legs that supported bodies, with overlapping plates of chitin debauch unto the beach. Antennae twitched, and black, soulless eyes glittered as they rotated in search of prey. Once again, the monsters 
each around eight feet in length set out, undulating along the trail of the intrepid trio of Grunlanders. Thorsten knew they were getting to a point where they would have to flee and fall or stand and fight. He called a halt. We are all too tired to keep running. There are only four of them. Let's fight. If we can crush their heads, the bodies will die, and we will be able to stop and rest for a moment. He looked into the two panting, flushed faces of the young people and both nodded in agreement. He noted that Brodil had exchanged her walking stick for Arne's harpoon at some point during their brief sojourn at the fork in the tunnels. He grimaced and nodded in approval as he set his mind to the new task at hand. The enormous centipedes had nearly caught up to them with their steady, untiring pace. One was in the lead and stopped as Thorsten stepped forward, using the iron tip of his walking staff like a short spear. Yet as he struck, the target moved swiftly, and the sharp tip of his weapon struck only gravel and dirt. The centipede had raised the upper third of its body from the ground and issued a high-pitched shrieking hiss that grated on the senses of each of the humans who faced it. Thorsten stepped forward and buried his axe beneath the obsidian orbs and twitching antennae. By then, two of the creatures had approached and engaged his companions. They had learned from watching Thorsten's encounter how to get the monsters to raise up and become targets. And two more of the creatures joined the first in twitching death spasms. The fourth and final, the largest at nearly ten feet long, rose and struck towards Thorsten's chest. The heavy impact knocked him onto his back and left him at the mercy of the beast. He had not felt the burning sting that he expected when the thing hit him. There had been no teeth to sink into his flesh, but now its tremendous weight crushed him to the floor. As its many claws pierced him through his thick-layered clothing, the stinking chitin brushed across his face, and he turned away in disgust and fear. This is it. My bride will now be a widow, he thought in despair. Yet the weight decreased, and the hissing monster soon passed over him and skittered on down the beach. He looked to his companions to see how they had fared, and both still wore terrified expressions. Thorsten climbed to his feet, sore and mystified, as he looked after the retreating form. Maybe they were just going in the same direction. Maybe not everything wishes to eat us. They found some jagged rocks that had fallen from a higher point at some time in the past and perched among them. They would present no serious barrier to oversized insects, yet they provided a sense of comfort to the human psyches that had been sorely tested so recently. They opened their bindles and took out the little food and small containers of water they had brought. I want my blanket, though it's not as cold as it should be, Brodil opined. Though they had spent days together, for the first time Thorsten noticed just how young she was no more than a year or two older than Arnson. I think that the warmth must have come from the water, a current that's coming from the ocean, though I have no idea how the water is warmed. I know that in Iceland they have volcanoes that burn and steam in competition with the cold. Perhaps the currents originate from those lands. The young people were apparently too worn from their ordeal to respond coherently. So Thornston suggested that they rest, and that he would take the first watch. He saw that Arnson ensured that Brodil was comfortable as possible before he settled in beside her, so that each might share warmth with the other. He smiled to himself. Even here they are clinging to life, and perhaps to love. Brodil is young, and will soon heal from her losses. And Arnson is a young man as much as he is a boy. The thoughts comforted him as he began his long vigil. He soon nodded off and slumped against the back of his rock chair. When he awakened, it was to Arnson, tagging at his leg. Thornston, I think we should leave. We have seen several more groups of large monsters troop by, and many of the ones with little lanterns on their heads have passed our camp, he shuddered. No spiders, though. They were soon ready to travel once more. Let's go back up the tunnel we entered, Thorsten suggested. 
Now we know that most of the creatures will not harm us if we stay out of their way. It's the shortest route home. The others agreed, but soon found that there were many openings that led upward. They were unsure of which one they had used, which would lead them to the main tunnel. Arnson suggested that they could follow their own tracks, but they soon discovered that those had been obliterated by the tracks of tiny feet and large dragging bodies. Finally, Thorsten shrugged. There were lights at the end of most of the passages. It looks like they might all empty into this room, and many came from the cave at the end of the plunging way. He glanced up at the dark roof overhead, too far for the glow of the fungi to reach. We need to get back above ground and make our way home. We are low on food, and who knows how much time has passed, where Sana still casts her light. We found that more and more, he had turned to the old gods for comfort, as the recent trials had shown him that they perhaps were better equipped to face such eldritch challenges than the Prince of Peace. He would have to be careful when they reached Iceland. If his alterations in belief came to light, the local church might prosecute him for it, and the penalty for apostasy were steep. I'd be better off dying here and now, he thought bitterly. He peered into an opening that he thought looked familiar. Do you think it was this one? It goes pretty straight and slopes upward. The young couple looked and agreed that it must be the way they had come before. They climbed for a distance, perhaps not so far as they had descended. Then the shaft turned sharply, one that had not been present in the first passage. It curved away and perhaps paralleled the shoreline they had departed. They determined that they should continue. None felt like descending and climbing into another passage that might lead into yet another false direction. Soon their suspicions were proved when the tunnel opened onto a rocky shelf above the water. They took seats along the ledge, feet dangling down towards the relatively calm waters below, and rested for a moment to collect their thoughts. It's not all ugly, Arnson offered. The light is pretty in a way, and the sea, while it smells stale and thick, is pleasant enough. Bodil sniffed at all. Everything here is ugly, foul, and reeks of death. She choked back a sob. Poor Snorri. Thorsten was inclined to agree, but kept the thoughts to himself. He looked along the shelf and saw that another portal led upward from it, and in the right direction. He was about to inform the others when the waters below suddenly grew turgid and tremulous waves washed over the rocks along the shoreline. A hideous, bulbous cone emerged from the depths, and tentacles snaked around and reached in various directions, seeking prey, perhaps, though none could know what passed inside that enormous head, the Kraken. Thornston screamed in his mind, his breath having fled his lungs so that he was unable to shout his consternation. The shelf was a good 30 feet above the water, but Thornston knew the extent of those seeking, grasping appendages. He ushered his two charges into the new shaft and turned back to determine whether death would catch him this time. His eyes met a single orb on the hideous countenance that faced him. It blinked its nictating membrane over the surface to clear its eyesight, and Thornston found himself staring into an enormous, hate-filled eye that saw him only as potential prey. Small prey. Immediately, one of the tentacles probed towards his perch on the shelf. He fled into the passage and urged his companions to their best speed. Run or die! The Kraken has spied us! They fled upwards as fast as the occasional low ceiling permitted. A thundering, wet slap sounded at the entrance to the tunnel behind them. The greater light from the cavern was occluded in the sounds of the tremulous, sinuous, slithering appendage pursued them up the tunnel. As tired and hungry and thirsty as they were, they scrambled and crawled and clawed their way ahead. Thornston in the rear felt something large but soft strike the back of his legs. The force propelled him forwards and on to the rear of Arnson, 
who in turn was pushed into Brodil's hindquarters. They all fell forward and were pushed ahead in a pile of humanity for another 20 feet. Then the pressure suddenly ceased. The tip of the tentacle writhed before them, but it did not follow any further up the tunnel. A glowing stench emanated from the appendage, the smell of dead things from the bottomless depths of the ocean. Thornston laughed hysterically. The arm gets thicker as it nears the body of the creature. The tunnel is too narrow for the tentacles to embrace us. How about we give it a sting? And with that, he stood and drove the tip of his walking stick into the pallid flesh of their tormentor. The shaft plunged all the way into the stinking flesh. The teens soon added their harpoons, each finding that the flesh gave easily. The tentacle indeed retreated down the passage, leaving the crushed and faded remains of the friendly glowing fungi that had guided them. But taking the staff and the two harpoons, there was still plenty of growth ahead, along with some non-luminous lichen that boded well for the presence of living things, and they resumed their journey along the pathway of light. Soon the tunnel increased in size, and they found themselves in yet another crevasse, this one roofed with ice. As the temperature dropped, the fungi faded and the lichen increased. Light from above soon penetrated from a clear, cerulean sky. They'd passed beyond the eternal ice and soon found themselves on rough turf, not far from the sea. They turned west towards home and within a few days arrived, hungry, exhausted, and dirty, in Valsi. Thornston was overwhelmed with bliss as he embraced his loving wife. Ugh, oh, you stink, she exclaimed. He pulled away in embarrassment. She quickly caught him up in her arms. I didn't say let go. I can endure your stench after you endure such a journey. They ate as much as they could stand, though they had long been able to slack their thirst, having been supplied with water by the numerous cold springs that flowed from the ice sheet towards the ocean. Each slept in the next day, warm for the first time in days. About mid-afternoon, Thorsten was awake by shouts outside. He scrambled to his feet, picked up his weapons, and rushed to meet the new horror he assumed would greet him. He was elated to see that the shouts were in greeting for Frodo's returning party, now reduced to just the man himself and one companion. Each appeared wounded and limped and stumbled until friends seized and supported them. Thorsten soon found himself in Frodo's home hovering over his sick friend as Frodo had watched over him. The wise eyes looked up, haunted by recent horrors, inflicted not by monsters from the deep, but from fellow humans. We left the western colony and trekked back towards home. The thralls accompanied us, remaining mostly in our wake as is proper. When we drew near the ice shelf, we had to camp. In the night, the Thralls and a band of Skraling attacked us. The Thralls had been in league with the Skralings all along, and become as degraded as their new tribe, devourers of human flesh. Gorm and I barely escaped with our lives, but we took several of them with us, including one of the White Thralls. Thornston hung his head briefly and quietly informed Frodo that he was the lone survivor of the trek. Gorm died from a fever brought on by infections in his wounds. Our already small band of settlers has been reduced even further. Over the next few days, the sad remnants of the outpost gathered what belongings and provisions they could and boarded the last of their ships. The tiny fleet fled straight to the sea on the ebbing evening tide. They wished to get as far from Kronlin as possible in the coming dark before they adjusted their course for Iceland. They took with them records from the church, but they held a moot and all agreed that there would be no mention of the Kraken. Father Knud assured them they would do well to put the devil behind them as they sought the deep blue sea. Note. Records indicate that Sigrid Bjorn's daughter and Thornston Olafsson married at Hvalsi Church. They eventually settled in Iceland around 1424 CE. There are numerous theories as why Greenland colony failed and what happened to those who left it. 
Currently, the thinking is that there was a long, slow decline, and only at the end was there an abrupt departure. An observation, my own, and likely specious, the mound culture in the Americas started to fail around the same time. No clear connection. They were distant from another. Just saying. Michael Bear Lockhart. <laughs> so, quote, this raven. Oh, thank you so much, Bear. I so much enjoyed this story. Um... And I hope you all did as well. <laughs> Thank you so kindly for stopping by my chateau, my darlings. It does mean so much to me. Please, if you have not subscribed, as many of you have not, please do so. Give me a like so I know what you would like to hear. And comment. I always love to read your comments. And special thanks to my Patreon and membership supporters. Ciao, darling.